Thank you, Ed and Kyle. Uh, Kyle for all of your help setting up and Ed for this uh, wonderful opportunity. I am so delighted to be back on the FMC First Friday webinar series. I think this is a great program covering so many interesting topics. So here we go uh, with the filth on flies. So I'm going to be covering um, a little bit about the biology of uh, flies, uh, their behaviors, some of their adaptations and make them so successful and also about IPM, which is how to manage them, right? So let's start with diptera diversity. That's a beautiful picture that shows a number of different flies and, and how, how remarkable they are. How they look similar and yet they are so different and uh, just a really, really fascinating order. Uh, so the order diptera, uh, the name, as the name suggests, diptera. So the D or the di means two, and tira is wing. So that means they have only two wings. That's what the name suggests. But we'll talk more about that. They do have two pairs of wings, but we only see two. That's why they're called diptera. And diptera are the fourth most diverse insect order. The most diverse being Coleoptera, the beetles, but Diptera, focus on Diptera here. So an extremely diverse order worldwide in distribution. You find flies everywhere. There's no place on earth that, well, except the poles maybe, but that doesn't, doesn't have flies, okay? Some kind of flies or the other. And uh, over 160,000 species are known uh, and more are being discovered every day. Um, extremely significant economically and ecologically. So the diptera is one of the most important insect orders in terms of relation to humans. They can be biting or annoying pests. The, one of the most important concerns is the public health concern because they are vectors of uh, many diseases of humans and animals. Uh, on the beneficial side, they are pollinators. A um, lot of flies are pollinators. And uh, of course, they're not managed and uh, their pollination is not, the amount of pollination service they provide is, is probably not documented as well as with honeybees, but they are pollinators. Um, and in some crops, um, that fly uh, pollination is really essential. And um, they are also predators. Many flies are predaceous. They prey on pests and um, other arthropods, insects and other arthropods. Some are parasitoids, live as parasites on other animals. Uh, decomposition is a very, very important function as well that uh, flies, the order diptera provides. They decompose organic matter. And many dipterans are prey. Both the adults and the young ones are prey for other larger predators. So a very, very significant order. Okay, quick overview of diptera there. Um, so a little bit about the taxonomy, and I had to mention this uh, because it's somewhat technical, but it will help you to uh, distinguish between the two major suborders and uh, what we are going to talk about today. It's impossible to cover all of Diptera in, in one session, just impossible. So I wanted to do this quick uh, run through uh, of the two major suborders. So this, the, the one is called Brachycera. Um, on the left, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today. The other suborder is Nematocera, very different, okay? If you just look at those characters listed out there. So Brachycera are stout, you know, chunky flies. Even if they are little, they are chunky in build. Whereas Nematocera, the slender, length, you know, long, long, elongated bodies and really delicate looking flies. Think mosquitoes, midges. And for Brachycera, think of house flies, right? Blue bottles, house flies. So they're chunky, but the other ones are slender. Brachycera have short, stiff antennae, very, very short, uh, stiff antennae. And um, sometimes they're not even visible. You, you may not pay attention to their antennae if you see them. But in Nematocera, they're long and feathery. Um, the larvae in, in Brachycera are called maggots. And uh, they're very distinct in shape. They look like carrots, little carrots, but cream colored, not orange. And they don't have any appendages, no head, no legs, nothing, just a carrot. 
And um, in, in nematocera, the larvae are usually aquatic. Okay, I think mosquito larvae again, and they do have a head. They, the appendages can be, uh, the head can be clearly distinguished. They're worm-like, not carrot-shaped, but their head can be clearly distinguished. So think again of mosquito wrigglers, right? So I'm using mosquitoes a lot, but there's so many other nematocerans as well. Um, in Brachycera, the adults and larvae, they're both terrestrial. They're not aquatic. They might um, be, the larvae might be found in semi-solid uh, decaying organic matter, but adults are definitely uh, terrestrial. Even larvae, they cannot survive if they're submerged in water. Whereas in Nematocera, the adults are terrestrial. Larvae are aquatic, but adults are terrestrial, and they feed on nectar or uh, organic matter, depending on the species. Whereas in Brachycera, uh, almost all of them uh, live in different kinds of terrestrial, uh, live in different kinds of organic matter. The adults feed also on organic matter or blood or um, other sugary material, nectar, different kinds of food, depending on the species. So that's a quick uh, overview, right? There's a clear distinction between the two kinds of flies. And uh, we're going to be talking more about Brachycera. Not, again, not all of Brachycera, but that's the suborder that we're going to be focusing on. And uh, here's another quick overview of Brachycera. So um, those, the points that I've highlighted in blue, with, in blue font, are common to both Nematocera and, and the Brachycera. Uh, so Diptera, we already said, they have two pair, visible pairs of wings, membranous wings. The wings are membranous. And uh, the second pair, this is the interesting part. I don't know if you can see my cursor here moving. If you look at the picture of the mating flies, you'll see a little white dot or a cream colored uh, dot in the middle of the fly, towards the middle of the fly body. You see that? So you can see it in the male, which is on the top, and also on the female, uh, which is on the bottom. So that's the second pair of wings, the hind pair is of wings, it's, it's modified to form a balancing organ called the haltier. So the haltiers are really, really fascinating organ. They are loaded with sensory, which helps the flies to sense different aspects of flight. So that's why they are such excellent flyers. And we'll talk about that in a second. But wings, the front pair of wings, which we can see in all of these flies here on the screen, they cannot fold over each other as in many other insects. They are separate. They are held over the abdomen, but not, do not cover it completely. They're held separate kind of. They don't, they don't fold over each other. And um, that's an important character that helps to distinguish flies from certain other kinds of pollinators that you see around. Okay. They don't fold over each other. Mouth parts are piercing and sucking, sponging or chewing in Brachycera in general. Uh, and uh, larvae are maggots. We just talked about uh, larvae, and we'll see lots of maggot pictures. So don't no worries if you haven't seen maggots. They uh, they don't have any apparent appendages. They have only a long carrot shaped body. And adults feed on different kinds of decaying organic matter depending on the species. Okay, quick overview of Brachycera there, and the flyers, champion flyers. They are such good flyers that uh, it's really unbelievable how well they can they can make turns, they can fly and just stop in midair, just like halt, complete stop in midair, and then take off from that point. It's just fascinating to watch uh, flies fly. Uh, they're in there really literally in in at their best when they fly. And in this picture, this is a surfed fly or a hover fly. Uh, very, very beneficial insect. Uh, and if you look carefully, you can see uh, um, it's, you can somewhat make out its wings and, and antennae in the front of its face and its head. Okay. So that's that. And then a little bit about the life cycle, uh, biology, the biology. So uh, flies, diptera, are holometabolous, which means they have complete metamorphosis. Uh, and this is opposed to the incomplete metamorphosis that we see in certain insects, right? Like grasshoppers or stink bugs, the true bugs. So flies, all of diptera are holometabolous, which means they have complete metamorphosis and they have four distinct 
stages in their life cycle. The egg, starting with the egg, or starting with the adult, the adult lays eggs, the eggs hatch into larvae, and the larvae turns into a pupa, into pupae, and then the adult emerges. So very, very distinct four stages that look nothing like each other. Whereas in the case of um, the in, incompletely metamorphosing insects, the nymphs, the young ones are nymphs and they look similar to the adult, right? But here, if you didn't know that uh, the maggots are the young ones of the adult fly, you wouldn't even know what they were, right? They look so different. The pupa looks entirely different. So that's that. And they're uh, in favorable conditions, it's really favorable conditions, life cycles can be very, very short, right? As short as seven to day, eight days. So in a week, you get a new batch. Very, very pro prolific. And, and fl uh, fly filth flies, uh, which is a, a group of the Brachycera, which I'll talk about soon, uh, are very prolific. They lay, they are known to lay more than a hundred eggs, uh, sorry, thousand eggs in, in a period of two weeks. So lots and lots of eggs. Um, the eggs re resemble miniature rice grains. They're cream in color, even they, the color is similar to rice grains and very, very tiny, but not microscopic. You can actually see them. You can see housefly eggs. Uh, you probably not all brachycerin eggs, but you can definitely see housefly eggs, something that's familiar, right? Larvae are creamy white. Typically, again, they can vary slightly in color from you know yellow or, or orange-ish yellow to uh, white, almost white. The puparium or, or the pupa, which doesn't have a cocoon, that's just the pupa or the puparium, uh, are also barrel-shaped or um, cylindrical, you could say. And uh, the sizes, of course, vary with the species. The colors can also vary, but they're typically that reddish brown in color. Sometimes they're yellow, more yellow. Sometimes they're almost black in color. Okay, So that's very quickly about the life cycle of, of flies and uh, you know those times, how, how fast they can reproduce, etc. So now I want to talk a little bit about the public health importance of flies which is a very, very important concern. And that's why they're so significant ecologically and economically, the amount of resources that are spent to uh, manage them uh, is because of this concern. So um, everyone knows, almost everyone knows that filth flies can transmit diseases to humans and animals. And uh, an, a, over a hundred different pathogens have been recorded from house flies meaning on their surface, our external body surface. And some are recorded from inside their gut, their digestive tract. Over 65 of them are successfully transmitted. So it's one thing when the pathogens are on the fly's body, doesn't mean that they can be transmitted from one spot to the other, but over 65 of them have been recorded to be successfully trans transmitted. And some of the diseases, transmit just by house flies and uh, their uh, respective pathogens. It's just such a long list. I, I don't even want to read out all of those uh, names there, but um, just uh, that there are all kinds like there's viruses, there's rickettsia, uh, protozoans, worms or helminths. Um, there's even fungi that flies can trans, filth flies can transmit from one spot to the other. So uh, really, really big public health concern. And the amazing thing is that they don't even bite. Filth flies, at least that group, don't bite. They don't bite uh, and do not feed on blood just by being from one in one spot and then in another spot is the way they transmit. So it's called mechanical transmission. So typically filth flies are mechanical vectors. And they transfer pathogens from one from a contaminated source to a clean spot. That's what they do. So there, the biological association between the pathogen or the disease-causing microbe and the vector is not required in this case. So there's no multiplication of the pathogen within the whole, within the vector, as is the case in certain some other vectors like mosquitoes, for example, or ticks. Right? That is a process that takes place within the vector. But in this case, that does not happen. 
So the multiplication of the pathogen or the pathogen completes its life cycle either in its um, original host or in the environment. That's, uh, that's where they multiply. The, the filth flies or the mechanical vectors merely provide the function of transferring them. And uh, multiple routes are possible in this uh, sort of uh, transmission, mechanical transmission. There can be direct transmission. That is, uh, in, for example, eye gnats. Um, you know, if some, in some say, situations, you may have seen flies crowding around the eyes of, of cattle, right? And, and even people in some cases. Uh, so they feed on eye secretions. Uh, and, and in that process, they can transmit certain infections. Uh, yours is a kind of infection that can be transmitted through eye secretions. Then there's also indirect mechanical transmission where um, food or um, other material that is already infested with maggots, fly larvae, are consumed. And that causes an infection once it enters the body of the host. So that is another the, an example of indirect mechanical transmission. So all of these, uh, this is the, uh, again, a very quick idea about how flies transmit pathogens. So there's no biological um, uh, or chemical uh, processes that go on inside the fly, but it's just mechanical, okay? Uh, some concerns, and I just wanted to mention uh, this uh, condition called myiasis. Uh, myiasis is an infestation of tissues with fly larvae. That's the general term. Myiasis is a general term that indicates an infestation of tissues. It could be tissues of humans, it could be tissues of animals, and they could be dead or living tissue. And uh, it's a very, very... Uh, serious condition and um, it's very uh, the occurrence is very high in certain situations like when there are extreme events flooding or earthquake and people crowd together and there are unsanitary or unhygienic uh, conditions that's when myiasis occurs typically when it occurs and uh, it's because flies there's a lot of flies in those situations right and uh, flies come and lay eggs on tissue and there's no way to clean it and sometimes there are wounds open wounds that that are very attractive to certain species of flies so in some cases the myiasis is accidental so they the flies come and lay eggs and then the infest, infest, uh, infestation starts sometimes they are ingested through food or other material so uh, and the, the, that can cause in, uh, infections like they could be enteric or stomach problems. They, it could be in the rectal or urine, urine, urogenital area uh, or through wounds. So all of that uh, can be sites for accidental or faculty. And certain species of flies are faculty. They don't have to lay eggs in, in those spots. They just found it good. So they laid eggs. And in those cases, the larvae are passively transported. So the larvae don't. Uh, do anything um, in in some cases the larvae do not really do anything they can also be passively transported through the digestive tract expelled through uh, feces and then that can lead to another route of uh, round of uh, infections there's also obligate myiasis like some species have to have uh, living host tissue for development and a great example is uh, bot flies. I don't know if anyone is uh, familiar uh, with uh, bot flies or has seen uh, a, a, a blood bot fly developing. It's a really um, disturbing uh, picture. And I have pictures, but I'd not include them here uh, of bot flies developing on, in human tissue. They actually live there. They, they live and they develop and when they're ready to emerge, they will um, emerge. It's really disturbing. Uh, so that's obligate. They need that living tissue. And uh, so control of myiasis is a really uh, needs a concerted effort. And um, it's typically found when situations like that are going on after ex extreme events. And um, when there's a lot of overcrowding, people don't have proper shelters or uh, 
they sleep on the ground and un- in unhygienic on the dirt situations like that and infestations can definitely be cured it's not uh, most of the time it's not lethal or anything like that and um, some of you may have also heard this the medical use of myasis it's called maggot therapy where certain species of um, f- uh, fly maggots are introduced into um, human tissue and they clean up the decaying when there's gangrene or you know necrosis of the tissue they clean out areas which are severely damaged and then the maggots are removed so that helps in wound clean up so um, again um, i do have pictures but i did not include them because it would be too disturbing right and um, um, the myasis or just flies are also very important in forensic entomology right so if you think of a crime scene or, or if there's a dead body somewhere what are the first insects to arrive on the scene they flies so the flies that are on a uh, uh, dead body provide very important clues as to the time of death or uh, various and various other factors that led to it led to the death so flies are also very important in uh, forensic entomology so just thought i'd mention it there but again this the subject is not for everyone so we don't really have to dwell on it i just wanted to mention it here but let's talk about uh, when to suspect or expect fly borne illnesses and um, there are certain conditions that are very very favorable for for flies for for their population development and we just mentioned when there's an extreme event like flooding or an earthquake and you know that displaces everything so in those kinds of uh, situations there's often massive increases in fly populations of course they have a lot of in those situations there's a lot of breeding ground no control efforts like and uh, usually there's high temperature a lot of humidity and it also increases the number of fly uh, human uh, interactions right when there's a lot of flies there's a lot of chances they can interact with humans in different ways so in those situations the potential for spreading of diseases is also very very high so definitely extreme events are a situation where you can expect or suspect fly borne illnesses and um, especially in the case of a flood there's a flood when flood waters recede they leave behind a, a deposit right along the sides of the roads or, or wherever they're receding and uh, that deposit is a rich breeding ground for flies they have lots of nutrients from all kinds of different sources and uh, they're moist and stays moist for a long period of time because there's flood waters right next to them so ideal ideal situation and um, both flies and rodents i had to mention rodents here bec- uh, because they are often together they often uh, they are often found together in these kinds of situations right uh they call opportunistic so they use that opportunity or uh, where they, when there is abundant resources and uh they can uh you know the populations can just explode and go crazy so the two groups of pests that flourish absolutely thrive after an extreme weather event especially one that involves flooding so all of these um things happen everything collapses in an extreme event right extended power outages uh sewer systems are damaged and sometimes flood the landscape leaving behind uh all kinds of uh, trash garbage spoiled food rotting vegetation dead bodies so naturally they are all very very favorable to flies so um regarding the environmental conditions for fly development what are the most favorable definitely warm summer conditions are very very favorable and uh, these the temperatures of course vary the most favorable temperatures vary with the species genus and the species but they can be really really short like house fly i'm i'm using the example of house flies because everyone knows about house flies right so they can uh, complete a life cycle in as uh, soon as 7 days so within a week you have a new batch and in temperate regions 
uh, about 10 to 12 generations are possible per year. Uh, whereas in tropical and subtropical regions, there can be more than 20. That's staggering. The number of uh, generations that they can have. And um, the longevity of, of flies, of individual stages, especially of the adults, is enhanced by the availability of food. And uh, so it's not always manure or organic matter that they're looking for. They need um, certain nutrients for their development. So if there's especially sugar, a slightly sweet uh, things in that decaying mass, that really enhances their longevity. And regarding temperature, it's not always the high temperatures that are favorable to them. Again, it uh, depends greatly on the species, but in house flies, if it's really, really hot, like what we are experiencing here in Phoenix right now, uh, it's not the ideal, it's not the best temperatures for flies, house flies to develop. So they live longer in cooler temperatures. And access to animal manure alone does not lengthen adult life. They need other nutrients too. And females need protein for egg production. So again, manure alone or digging organic matter alone is not sufficient. And uh, their reproductive potential is just staggering. Like it's, so, it's beyond our imagination, but thankfully it's often always never realized. But if, if it were, so this is an interesting um, estimation that some scientists from Florida did. And, uh, you know, a pair of flies beginning reproduction in April, just as the weather, you know, spring weather begins to warm up and everything, optimal conditions, uh, they started their life. And uh, if all of their offspring were to live, what would be the number that would uh, we would have by August, by April, May, June, July, August, five months? Can anyone guess the wi a wildest guess? You can... You can just think about the answer or you can even put in there. There you go. I already got an answer. Five billion. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to give you the answer. And uh, it's very good. Actually, it's, I think that's close. But here's the answer. I don't even know how to read that number. So it's just unbelievably uh, huge. But thankfully, we don't, we never uh, realize that flies never realize their true potential, reproductive potential. There's so many other things. They don't always get those optimal conditions and uh, all of their offspring never survive. So uh, it's their strategy to ensure that their uh, species is carried forward. So now <laughs> let's look at some species. Uh, flies important species so i early i did think i would uh, do you know separate out regions like southwest pacific northwest southeast etc but first of all there's really no uh, i don't have time to do that and also because i do want to uh, talk about management which is, i think that's a, a topic of great interest <laughs> yeah 191 gazillion i just glanced at the chat gazillion right uh, and also, um, the majority of the species, the, the kinds of flies are the same across the country. So there's filth flies and there's a few other kinds of flies. Species, individual species, right, quintillion, might vary with, with the region, but um, the kinds of flies are mostly the same uh, all over the, the country. So I just thought I'll do filth flies and then so, so a few other kinds of flies. So filth flies, because they are so of such a uh, great public health concern, uh, I wanted to talk about those a little bit more than others. Okay, so I'll just start again. Filth flies are called filth flies because of their affinity for filth or decaying organic matter. And uh, they're nuisance pests and also they are vectors. So that's the concern with them. And um, these are the four most common types of filth flies. House flies, blow flies, uh, flesh flies, and drain flies. These are the four most common ones. And uh, house flies are the most common domestic flies everywhere in the world. Okay, There's no place uh, on, 
anywhere in the world, of course, probably except the poles that doesn't have houseflies. It's just crazy how widespread they are. And um, they are pretty familiar. I think most people can identify houseflies. They're, they're small, dark gray flies, um, about a quarter inch in length. And uh, they have dark red eyes. And this is a great picture. And they have uh, some dark stripes on their thorax, which are the back of their chest region, if you could call it that. And um, the, the stripes run, run lengthwise. <laughs> there we go. We have uh, uh, someone answer in a very unique way, flies on the <laughs> in the chat with lots of pictures of flies. I love it. Uh, and um, so that, yeah, back to fly, house flies. And um, they do not, uh, the abdomen is, is gray, light grayish or tan in color. It's not entirely gray. So that's um, uh, an important character. And uh, it's, it doesn't have any other colorations, light gray or tan in color, depending on the, how, how well the housefly has fed and uh, it's, its age, uh, probably, uh, that has an effect on the coloration. Um, but uh, typically, people can identify houseflies. And they don't bite or sting, um, but they can be extremely annoying, right? And um, yeah, I see a question in the, in the Q&A. We'll come to that. And uh, when they fly into homes and, and settle down on food or other services, that's a huge problem. And nobody likes flies around. So um, that is the big concern with them. And uh, we already discussed we, uh, flies, house flies transmit a lot of microorganisms. And uh, they mechanically carry these pathogens. They don't have to process the pathogens before injecting it or transferring it to another spot. So they carry the pathogens on their body body surfaces and you know all hair they're very hairy they have lots of hair all over their body and also within their body in the digestive tract in their mouths and they can expel them through saliva vomit or feces so they do all of that while they're on our surfaces or places where we are interested in so that's the big problem with them okay so house flies and uh, want to talk about this, uh, their mouth parts, uh, which I find is uh, really fascinating. You know, just to think from an entomologist's perspective, right, how well they're adapted. And uh, uh, this is the, the they're called sponging mouth parts. So they're basically, they act like a sponge. And uh, if you look at the picture on the top, black and white picture on the top right, that's the, the underside of that mouth part. So you see, there's a lot of furrows grooves all along the, the underside, right? So when a fly finds a, a food source or, or some, it, it sees something, what it does is it'll inject its saliva and the saliva flows out through the central, the central opening and travels all into these different grooves. And it mixes with, the, with whatever material it is. And, and all of these, uh, this entire area, the entire body of the fly actually is loaded with sensory. So it can tell whether it's a good, it's a good food, how it tastes, right? All of that, it can tell that's suitable for, for me to eat. And it mixes that food with the saliva a little bit, dilutes it a little bit, and then it sucks it in through the same, those same grooves. So that's how the fly feeds. And here, uh, next, I have a little video that shows, again, it's available on YouTube, but please do check it out. You'll see. I have it goes at that uh, little yellow stuff. I don't know what that is, but it clearly shows the action. Okay, now a little bit about the life cycle of, uh, yeah, uh, no, it's the, it's, it was the back noise in the video, sorry, it's not background noise. Okay, so I saw a question in the chat. So, <clears throat> about uh, housefly life cycles, uh, they're extremely short, 
uh, much shorter than uh, many of the other filth flies. And um, the optimal temperature from um, to complete the life cycle from egg to adult is about 25 to 30 degrees. Actually, now what we are experiencing here in Phoenix is much higher than it's optimal for house flies. And um, they lay hundreds, thousands of eggs and populations can just explode if the conditions are optimal. And the larvae, they actually need moisture. So if it's really hot and dry, like in um, Phoenix right now, uh, it's not ideal for larvae to develop. So there's a lo lot of larval mortality. So housefly populations don't explode, but if they have that uh, required moisture and periods of time when the temperature is optimal, that gets them you know, cranking out a lot of young ones. So in, that's very quickly, and, and this is a great picture also of the different uh, stages in the life cycle. There's the eggs, larvae. This is a great picture of the larvae. You can see the carrot shape, right? And, and the narrow end is actually the head end. And the broader end is the, is the rear end. And there are the pupae. And I saw a comment earlier in the uh, chat about the pupae. The puparium is actually the, la the larval skin. That's true. That's correct. That changes into the case. And there's no cocoon, as in the case of like, butterfly larvae or anything like that. Okay, so that's about um, the life cycle and uh, species. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, lookalikes, right? A lot of people have questions about lookalikes. So this is one uh, very common species. Uh, little, they call little houseflies because they are little. They're smaller than a regular houseflies, uh, but they are a different genus. So houseflies are musca. This is Fania. So um, they look very much like houseflies, but their racing stripes on the thorax are not very uh, distinct. And um, they're more common uh, in um, the cooler months, not now in the summer. And they hover at face height, which is extremely annoying. And they're mostly found in outdoor um, uh, environments. They rarely come in indoors. So little house flies. Um, stable flies, another very important look-alike of the house fly. They look very, very similar. They have those um, stripes on the thorax, uh, but their abdomens are a little wider and have a spotted pattern. I'll show you pic a picture next with comparing a house fly and stable fly. And stable flies are blood feeders. They feed on blood from um, animals and humans. So they're found in, uh, they're very abundant in locations where there are livestock. And um, in livestock, they prefer to feed on the legs and the lower body. But in smaller animals like dogs, they can feed on the external ears. So that's about uh, stable flies. And I think the most important uh, distinguishing character, if you can see it, is the mouth parts that stick up in front of the face. You see that? So... So here, are, here is a comparison of stable flies and house flies. So you see they are actually uh, somewhat smaller than house flies and they have a spotted pattern on the abdomen. But otherwise, if you look from the thorax up, they look pretty similar except for the, the bayonet-like mouth part sticking in front of the stable fly. And uh, if you look at them from an angle, from the side, uh, no, stable flies are not the same as deer flies. I got the... Uh, I saw just glanced at the question and um, they're not the same. Um, stable flies are a different, uh, different genus and species. And if you look at them from the side, you'll see they rest at an angle. Stable flies rest at an angle, whereas house flies keep their body kind of parallel to the surface. So that's another way of distinguishing them. And they bite, they uh, bite and draw blood. So not like house flies. And um, here's another um, group of fly, housefly lookalikes. These are called flesh flies. They look like giant houseflies. They look very, very similar to houseflies. The coloration, the dark red eyes, the stripes on the back, and, but they're much larger. And um, uh, some species have a red tip to the abdomen. So that's another uh, kind of fly. And there's uh, scavengers. Uh, flesh flies um, belong to the family Sarcophagidae. I'm not going into those technical details, but uh, they scavengers and feed on uh, different kinds of organic matter again. 
and uh, they thrive in compost pits and uh, you know poorly maintained toilets or dog poop they love play spots like that and um, here is a video another video that i want to share about of a fly laying eggs and this is not house fly it's a, a blow fly which i'll be talking about next see how you know the fly is sticking out its over positive and uh, dropping eggs as she goes along see She's laid a, a bunch over there. Looks like uh, rice grains. Yeah. And you can also see her mouth parts. She's checking out the, the area that it's suitable for the young ones. Very fascinating, right? Again, this video is available, and you will hear some disturbance in the background. It's not. It's in the video, so no worries. All right. So, um, so that's an interesting sight to see. Other filth flies. Uh, so these are blue bottles or uh, blue bottle flies, green bottles, blow flies. They are called by different names and they belong to a different family, Californidae. They are very easily distinguished by their um, colors. They have bright metallic colors, green, uh, blue, uh, bronze coppery colored they're very very uh, beautiful to look at but of course they hang out in in disgusting locations they're mostly larger than house flies and um, they have a great affinity towards uh, feces they love it okay <laughs> so that's about blow flies and um, other filth flies so these these are another very common group of filth flies and they're abundantly found in digging fruit and veggies they call fruit flies or vinegar flies. So Drosophilidae, the they're teeny tiny, about one sixteenth of an inch. If the house fly is a quarter of an inch, it's about this is one sixteenth, much much smaller, and they're very familiar as well. Uh, the, the little flies that hover around. If you have rotting fruit, bananas, or um, rotting other rotting fruit, you're guaranteed to see them. And they have bright red eyes. Uh, that is also, uh, uh, it can vary, but the eye, red eye color is pretty common in Drosophila. So that's that. Uh, another group is uh, scuttleflies or uh, humpback because of their appearance. You see, it looks like they have a humped back. So another group of very um, small, uh, teeny tiny flies that are very common in uh, decaying organic matter. And this is not just indoors, but also uh, outside near dumpsters. If there's food fallen down, organic matter fallen down, then you can uh, you can see it. You can see these flies, and they scuttle across the surface. So that's about that's why they're called scuttle flies. Moth flies or train flies very common in um, trains, especially trains that are not cleaned out periodically and have a rich deposit of organic matter inside. So these are teeny tiny and and actually these are not brach brachycidans. They are nemat they belong to nematocera, the other suborder, but they are found so frequently in in those habitats that they are also grouped with filth flies. So that's why. And then you see their antennae, long feathery antennae, and um, really really delicate. They're not like the other brachycidans. So moth flies and. Uh, Fungus gnats, these are also not, don't belong to Brachycera. They are nematocerans, but they're very common in community environments. And uh, they have, uh, they are, these thrive in potted uh, plants, which are overwatered. You find them commonly. Okay, so just wanted to mention that. And uh, drains, so inside houses and buildings, if they have, especially floor drains are a big problem and floor drains are located under equipment or furniture where you cannot access them um, easily. That's when these, uh, a lot of these filth flies develop inside. Okay, so if you move equipment, then floor drain looks like that. I know disgusting, right? I had to show at least one disgusting picture <laughs> in a presentation on flies. Okay, so uh, that's about filth flies. Let's go move to another interesting group of flies called biting flies. I'm not going to the details of these, but I wanted to mention them. So biting flies are uh, 
a, a group that uh, feed on blood. They're blood feeders and they feed on different kinds of animals. And uh, deer fly are in, in some parts, in other parts of the country, they might be called sheep flies. Um, and then there's horse flies. So they belong to Tabanidae, different family. And um, their mouth parts are adapted to cut through skin and draw blood and feed. And I wish we had time to talk more about them. They're really interesting creatures. And um, deer flies are, uh, 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 can be easily identified by their eyes. They have brilliantly colored eyes. It's very, very interesting. And tabanids, it looks like they, the entire head is made up of their eyes. They're so huge, right? And of course, there's different species, you know, with the region, it varies a lot. And uh, some uh, flies are agricultural pests. I had to mention about the spotted wing drosophila. So if you remember the other drosophila, the vinegar fly that we discussed, the wings are clear, right? Here, their wings have spots. So spotted wing drosophila, very major uh, pest of fruits. Um, again, just wanted to mention that. And then some beneficial flies, sylphid flies. Uh, the, uh, I mentioned it in the beginning, sylphid flies are incredibly beneficial. Uh, they bee mimics. A lot of them are bee mimics with their yellow and black or orange and black coloration. And they're pollinators. Uh, and um, their larvae are predaceous. They feed on pests. So here you can see a sulfid larva feeding on aphids. Okay, so that's a very uh, <laughs> quick run through, uh, through uh, of the different uh, types of flies. Not all species, but different types. So now, and now I want to jump to management. Okay, so um, name this plant. Anyone recognize this plant? So we're going to talk about fly management. So there you go, Venus flytrap. Very good, well done. So um, if we had an, an option to grow this plant, right? It would trap all of the flies and, and the plant would benefit, we would benefit. Yeah, there some people have them, actually grow them. Yeah, very fascinating plants. So I just wanted to, before we dive into management, I want to talk about what are we really up against? And here's another video. Uh, it's also available on YouTube. Um, and Everybody loves a picnic. <laughs> With that straw-like proboscis, this fly is going to slurp your lunch, if you let it. Add in a little regurgitated liquid, and it turns your burger into a shake. It carries hundreds of types of bacteria around, on its legs and in its gut. Think you can take it on? A fly is a formidable opponent. Hairs and antennae feel the air move as you approach. And just look at its bulging eyes. It can see you coming from nearly every angle. Its eyes and tiny brain process information 10 times faster than ours. To a fly, we appear downright sluggish. In the air, it's in its element. Check out those razor sharp turns. the landing gone in a flash so what are we up against right really formidable en enemies so uh, i just want to put that out there before we dive into management and here we are trying to manage them but it's not impossible so that's why we have ipm right and uh, there's a number of components of fly ipm uh, Correct identification is important because they're all different. They have different preferences and um, eliminating breeding sites. That That is basically the crux of fly IPM, I would say. And eliminating breeding sites involves sanitation or waste management. And we saw some kinds of situations where there is uncontrolled or unmanaged organic waste, right? And that leads to population outbreaks, which may need intervention by pesticides. So we'll talk about that a little bit also. And uh, pest in, in normal conditions, pest proofing is another very important component of fly IPM because pest proofing actually involves simple techniques that prevent flies from getting in to 
to our environments like homes or structures. So that's why pest proofing is so important. And then there are baits and traps for capturing, actually capturing adults. And some traps can bring down numbers of flies to some extent. And these are, these are for adults, adult flies. And then ultimately there's pesticides uh, that we can use to treat areas for larvae and adult flies. So quick overview of the different components. Yeah. All right, so moving on with uh, IPM, um, really quickly covering uh, uh, with a few pictures. I think pictures speak a thousand words. So here are some examples of uh, waste management, <laughs> sanitation. And I've said fly management is waste management. You manage your waste properly, you manage flies. So here's a good scene, good um, uh, method of uh, managing waste. Uh, dumpsters are in a, in a clean area, concrete floor, not dirt. Uh, trash bags are... Uh, in good condition, placed inside the dumpsters, not overflowing. So that's good. Okay. How about here? Maybe not, right? The dumpster is located really close to the exterior door. And that increases the chances for flies to get in each time the door is open. So that's not good. Here is another uh, two more uh, not so good situations. Uh, there, the dumpster or the trash container is right next to the patio or the back porch, where it's easier to toss trash bags. But you know, in that process of tossing, sometimes the bags break open and then the dumpster gets really gross. Uh, so not good, okay? So there's a, a distance is, that's required. And here's another example of uh, pest proofing, important step in management. Um, uh, there's, you can see, I don't know if you can see it, but the door is propped open and there's a gap between the door and the and the wall. So clear uh, entry point for flies. The vent above the uh, door is, is slightly off. One of the blades is off. So that's another entry point. And did anyone notice the light over the door, right? So at night, uh, when the light comes on, flies are attracted to light. So when there's a light and then there's all these entry points, a wide open invitation for flies to come in so just wanted to point that out and so fixing just fixing those things would go actually go a long way in reducing fly population inside that building okay and uh, there's the use of monitors and monitoring which is a very good very essential step in, in fly management so there's a number of different types of traps available and uh, traps are good to sometimes bring down fly numbers in small environments, but um, they're also good for early detection, right? Some, you do not always see them sometimes, but when you have them in a trap, in a sticky trap or a UV light trap, you know that they're around and you can take necessary action. But when you're using homemade um, traps like with, with materials such as vinegar or essential oils for repellents, uh, it's always good to pay attention to the concentration because not all of these materials are, are of the same concentration and homemade does not necessarily mean safe, right? So it's always good to take precautions, use the correct PPE uh, gloves and, and all that, dispose of residues appropriately. So here are a few examples of different types of traps and monitors. Uh, there's a number of different uh, ones from homemade uh, ones in a soda bottle to actually plug in ones with, with UV light, commercially available ones, true fly traps, and this the traps for different fly species as well. And there's the fly tape, which is very, very common. And um, kitchens, uh, certain areas in buildings and structures are especially vulnerable to flies, right? It's places where there's food and kitchens, food service areas in general are very, very vulnerable. So that those areas require an extra a level of cleanup because otherwise, you know, things can get very quickly out of hand. So a regular cleanup of food residues and, and not only food residues, but also cleanup of the cleaning equipment like mops, for example, if there's a spill and the mop is used to clean up the spill, the mop should also be rinsed out, right? If, because if the food residue, if it's, you know, especially if it's, for example, fruit juice or, or, or milk, or something like that stays on the mop, 
the mop is moist, right? So that leads to very, very favorable environment for flies to develop. So that is essential. So I wanted to mention that. And of course, keep food covered in airtight containers if it's dry and outside or move them to a refrigerator. All of those are great for keeping flies away. A little uh, reiteration about dumpsters again and trash management. So make sure your trash uh, bags are good, good, good quality so that they don't rip open easily and make sure the dumpsters are clean, emptied on a regular basis and they don't overflow. And if you have overflowing dumpsters like this, maybe you need, the schedule needs to be adjusted. More frequent pickup or more dumpsters or larger capacity dumpsters. And uh, this is something that a lot of people don't pay attention to because um, uh, you know it's the trash can, right? right? Uh, after trash pickup then, we just forget about it. But sometimes the trash cans develop a, a layer of uh, organic matter inside because when we toss trash inside, sometimes the bags, bags break open and you know contents spill out and that lies there. So uh, a lot of companies provide uh, trash can cleanup services. So we could avail of that or we could um, also um, you know, the city or whoever provides trash pickup, sometimes cities also provide uh, cleanup or if dumpsters are damaged or worn out, they can be replaced upon request. So maybe that's something to consider. And here's a good um, uh, picture of a proper trash can or dumpster placement. So it's about at least 50 feet away from the external door of that building. And it's placed on a concrete slab, so there's no dirt. Uh, that's good. Uh, the dumpster is closed. The lid is, is fitting well. So here, this is a great example of proper dump, dumpster placement. And uh, cleaning out drains. So we talked about floor drains earlier. I mean, here's another dis disgusting one. So when there's organic matter buildup inside drains, I know that's pretty extreme, but it's a real situation. And that uh, needs to be cleaned out, right? So a lot of, uh, there are a lot of cleaners available, but I usually recommend something that does not have bleach in it because um, bleach actually corrodes the insides of drains and, and surfaces. It's a corrosive material. And actually it does take out some of the organic matter, but it also creates, due to corrosion, it creates more surface area inside the drain for, more organic matter deposits, right? So a better option would be an enzymatic cleaner or uh, a microbial cleaner that actually dissolves the organic matter and leaves the insides of the drain clean, smooth. So that's uh, it's a uh, very important step for wilt fly management inside structures. Uh, water leaks are great. So um, if there are watermarks on ceiling tiles, it's a sign that, uh, uh, there's some uh, there's a leak and that needs to be fixed. And uh, also always uh, uh, remember that adult flies may be in one area, but the origin may be somewhere else. And if you're finding adult flies inside a building or a structure, uh, it could mean, uh, definitely it could mean that they have a, a source somewhere. The source need not be inside, it could be outside. So there's an entry point or there could be a dead body inside. Right? There could be a rodent dead in the attic and flies have emerged from it. So it could mean different things. So use these uh, images as, as uh, pointers to look to, for inspection. Um, cleaning out roof gutters and storm drains to ensure free, free flow of water. So there's no water pooling. That's very uh, helpful. Uh, in potted plants, um, there's a Always there's the pot, the pot itself with the, with the potting media or the soil, and then there's the saucer. The saucer, of course, is is great for mosquito mosquito breeding, but all of this uh, these environments are favorable for flies to develop. So keeping mulch and bark levels to the to the minimum or to the optimum level and not overwatering also is helpful. Um, pest proofing. I already talked about pest proofing. Uh, it's to Simple steps to maintain, uh, you know, entryways to your homes and buildings 
maintain them in a in a good condition and intact so making sure door sweeps are in in good order window and door screens are in in good condition so all of those uh, provide the first barrier of defense for flies coming in and that's for in, indoor environments and uh, as uh, more examples of uh, mechanical control fly traps fly tapes uh, different kinds of uh, there are different kinds of electric traps that you can use uh, some um, buildings have an air door that you know there's a blast of air that comes in from above so there's a, a blower that's installed over the door that actually blows air outside so when you pull the door open and you walk and you feel a blast of air come at your face uh, and it's not just a gentle breeze but a blast of air so that's an air door that can, tends to push pests out so those are great for food service service areas but uh, we have to make sure that that blast is out towards the outside not inside that sucks pests in right <laughs> so that's another great option and uh, finally i want to talk a little bit about chemical control because chemical pesticides are an important tool in the toolbox so i thought i have to mention it so in most home situations or, or domestic situations uh, chemical pesticides are not necessary they're often the last resort but in certain extreme event situations then yeah or uh, in areas like it's a dairy farm or places like that you know slaughterhouses in those places pesticides may be needed so um, i'll talk a little bit about that and insecticide resistance so the use of insecticides has to be very done very very carefully with uh, uh, with some thought being put into it because insecticide resistance you see we saw how quickly flies can reproduce right so there the chances of them getting developing resistance is extremely high and very very fast it happens very very fast so that's why the use of chemical pesticides has to be uh, done with great caution okay so timing applications that's one very important step in using chemical pesticides to time applications properly not just apply pesticides throughout the year that's not required so pay attention to the weather conditions and when you see certain weather conditions developing right like when there's going to be high temperature warm temperatures and humidity that's the time when you you know when you start planning if you need an an application and monitor base applications based on monitoring so if you have monitors out for for adult flies use the information from them what kinds of flies are there how many that kind of information and uh, bait products are great because they attract the flies and and they kill them so apply bait products before fly, fly populations reach their peak like mid to late march as the temperatures are beginning to rise and those flies get beginning are beginning to get active you know finding mates laying eggs that's the time when you deploy baits and um the that's too early to spray you don't uh, where would you spray in that situation right so if but if adult populations rise uncontrollably then perimeter sprays like sprays outside of a building outside the perimeter of a building can be a problem okay. so I'll talk a little bit about product selection so the product selection has to be done and there's different kinds of products and i'll talk about just a few of them which are very very popular and common commonly available and uh, so th this varies with the situation right so in these there's some that can be used around poultry houses for example dairy facilities uh, places like that where there's a lot of live livestock and poultry quick bait is a great option it's a bait and it has the active ingredients imidacloprid which is a neonic neonicotinoid insecticide and um, it also contains triclosine which is a pheromone and that lures males male flies and attracts them and kills them and that stops stops them from reproducing right so quick bait is a great option because it can be used indoors and outdoors it can be uh, painted on or it can be scattered sprinkled around or it can be used in bait stations and um, it's very common very popular in in livestock facilities and it also has a component called bitrex which prevents it's bit makes it bitter and acts uh, prevents ingestion by pets and people 
So uh, that is a great mm, option. And um, um, another product for use in industrial or commercial settings, agricultural settings and non-food areas is golden mar marlin, or sometimes called golden marlin. That's also op an option. And it contains methomil, and this is important. So methomil is not uh, you recommended for use in uh, non-agricultural setting. The only non-agricultural use of methomil is as a flybait. And uh, fly, uh, methomil, the golden marlin can be uh, used as required to pro prevent, provide knockdown and reduction of fly populations. And it can be scattered around dumpsters or different places according to the label instructions. Okay, that's golden marlin. And then there's another uh, product for use in industrial or commercial settings, agricultural settings. And that's called quick strike, which contains another active ingredient called dinotefuran, but it also contains triclo triclosine, which is the pheromone. And uh, uh, another option uh, that can be used to scatter, scatter around these places so that flies are attracted. It attracts both males and, and um, yeah, males. And uh, they come at, they get attracted to the bait, they feed and they die. So that's uh, about quick strike. And dinotefiran is a broad spectrum insecticides, which is allowed for food uses. So it can be used safely. Uh, and there's an, also a number of other products that are available as ready to use sprays in for certain situations. So um, they can be, uh, there's one called fly band, Martin's fly band synergized pour on, which contains permethrin. There's another permethrin, there's several permethrin products and permethrin is a synthetic um, pyrethroid insecticide, which has quick action. So uh, it's a great it's great to reduce knockdown fly populations and can be used to spray on on exterior walls or places where flies rest. So that that's how it kills them. And uh, piperonyl butoxide or PBO is a common um, additive to these products that synergizes, enhances the action of the synthetic pyrethroid. Okay, so that's that, and then for uh, special considerations for um, residential or home environments or community environments are uh, repellents. So this is a, a, an option uh, called Mighty Mint. It's actually peppermint oil, supposed to be repellent to flies. Um, people also make homemade fly traps with vinegar. They use different kinds of sticky traps. But again, I want to reiterate to pay attention when you use these products because if it's homemade, it does not mean that it's safe always. So use the necessary precautions. So um, I believe that was my last slide about uh, IPM. Uh, and just want to share a couple of trivia uh, about uh, flies. So chocolate, I don't know how many of you knew this, but uh, chocolate comes from the fruits of the cacao tree in South America and it's fly, flowers are popped pollinated by a tiny fly they call the chocolate midge so without that fly we wouldn't have chocolate how tragic would that be right and also um the world's most dangerous cheese i don't know how if you've heard about this but it's kind of cheese delicacy made by introducing maggots into cheese and uh, the cheese uh, has to be consumed when the maggots are alive so i don't know how many of us would be up for that but uh, an example of, uh, uh, you know, how insects are used as food. But anyway, so in conclusion, Dr. Naya, are, can, yes. Can I, yes. Sorry, I was going to mention what, why you do this. Can I throw the quiz into the chat yeah. box? Yes, we're absolutely. a little over. So, so I, know. I know some people will have to go. And yes, it's okay yes, to go yes. over. Yeah. This is a great presentation. I know. Sorry. Uh, I, I know put, it was... put the quiz. It's Survey yes. Monkey. It's in there. If yeah. if you still have time, please stay and do it. Otherwise, we'll email it and, and yeah. back to you. You can wrap it up. Yeah, yeah. I'm so I know I went a little over time, but uh, 
so just in conclusion flies are really formidable um, creatures even though they are tiny and uh, they have so much going for them you know incredible reproductive capacity short lifespan and um, ability to develop resistance to a lot of commonly used um, pesticides so why, to manage them uh, what we have on our side is good management good sanitation practices and um, also keep in mind that uh, pesticide application should always be used as the last resort and following label instructions. So that's all I have in conclusion. And here's my contact information. Uh, this was a really great and informative presentation. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nair.